What's up, it's Rowan here from Artist Smart Education with another episode of the weekly HSC Economic Stats Update. In this episode, we're looking at the recent monthly CPI index that has been released by the ABS. We're looking at the impact of the reduction in inflation, what that means in terms of effectiveness of policy. We're also gonna be looking at some data coming out around forecast drop in Australia's commodity exports and the impact that'll have on the Australian economy. And finally, there's some more information coming out on the ACCC report into competition in the supermarket industry, and we'll take a quick look at how you can use that as part of micro-reform and the role of the ACCC. If this is your first time dialing in, in these episodes, I unpack and summarise the key headlines from around the domestic and global economy, giving you the key stats and analysis that you need to unlock a band six in the HSC economics course. So, as you can see, the ABS just released their monthly CPI indicator. Now note, the monthly indicator is not particularly reliable. It's got a fair bit of noise in it and the RBA does not look at this when they're looking at their uh, you know, cash rate updates in terms of their decision making. In saying that, okay, it's still interesting for us to look at to see what the trends in it show in terms of whether or not we're seeing downward pressure on inflation in the economy. Now ultimately inflation, you know, it still rose in the 12 months to August 2.7%. So we've still got inflation, but the positive here is that is down, okay? That is down from the 3.5% that it was in the prior month of July. So we can see that there's a real positive here. And we can see that if we scroll and have a look, we can see, okay, perfect, right? You know, we're 2.7, it was 3.5 before. So we've got things moving in the right direction, even if uh, you know, there's a fair bit of noise and this is probably the least reliable indicator around inflation. Now, what is driving this? Is it simply just, uh, you know, that the monetary policy is finally working and there's that time lag factor? Well, okay, sure, that may be part of what we're seeing. Um, but beyond that, The Guardian here and Greg Jericho has a great article that looks at some fantastic data for some other things that are also playing a role in placing downward pressure on inflation. And one of those things is actually government policy. So what we can see here is one of the things that's been identified is that the federal government had the energy bill relief as part of the rebate, rebates as part of the recent budget. Now, those rebates have also played out in Queensland, Western Australia, and Tasmania. And so the ABS here have estimated that if those rebates had not been in place, the average cost of electricity would have been 36% higher. Or, to put it another way, the amount of electricity that in June 2023 cost an average across Australia of 100 now costs $86 due to these rebates, but would have cost $117 without them. So as we can see, right, um, some of the fiscal policy that is flowing through as a result of the recent budget is having an impact in reducing some of the inflationary pressure that people are experiencing. Now, note last week we looked at the fact as well that retail spending has not really shifted. And so in other words, the fears that the government's budget would slightly you know, cause upward pressure on inflation through demand pull has also not materialized. So we've got a really great outcome here from an analysis of the federal budget showing that on the one hand, okay, it's not creating inflationary pressures as expected. And on the flip side, we've got some data here now from the ABS showing that it's also reducing inflationary pressure, particularly in terms of the cost of electricity. Now, what else is going on from a headlines point of view? Well, uh, what is uh, a major concern for Australia in terms of you know, the future is that uh, there's expected to be a $30 billion loss in combined earnings across our fossil fuels. And now this is a result of both falling demand, but as a result of that falling demand, also falling prices. And so part of this has been a result of the fact that we're seeing, a, you know, over the last couple of years, 22 and 23, as we can see here, as a result of the end of the COVID shutdowns, right, and the war in Ukraine choking global supplies, we've really seen this big energy demand that flowed through and we've been really, you know, reaping the benefit of that. Now, the reality is, though, uh, that um, across, okay, and we, we can see this, right, across like LNG, okay, we can see this across gas, okay, we can see it across coal exports, uh, you know, and even iron ore, right, what we're seeing is that expectation, okay, that, you know, combined earnings across coal and LNG could amount to a drop of $29 billion, right, um, which is really significant. Now, on top of that, we know from, again, prior weeks, and this is also an ongoing concern, Iron ore prices are also trading at two-year lows, right? And this is because of the Chinese slowing property market really dampening demand for steel, which is in turn dampening demand for iron ore. And so they're also tipped to fall by 30 billion this year alone. OK, 
Okay, that's 138 billion to 107 billion, easing even further then to 99 billion in the 2025 2026 period. Now, the challenge for this, okay, is obviously that Australia rely, has relied on this, uh, you know, export levels to do a couple of things. Number one, uh, you know, it drives economic growth and it's been a key driver and contributor to Australia's already anemic economic growth. So if we see that, you know, these export volumes start to go, you know, to, to shrink, um, that's going to produce just in terms of AD equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. It's going to have, um, you know, a, a lower impact on economic growth. And we're going to see that anemic economic growth unless, you know, macroeconomic policy, fiscal and monetary step in, we're going to see that growth potentially drop even further, okay? Um, on top of that, though, we can see that, you know, the resource and energy sector underpins the Australian economy, particularly because it supports more than a quarter of a million direct jobs. That's direct, not indirect. And so we can see that if we start to see these industries go backwards, which is clearly what we're going to see in terms of coming down from these high levels of demand, that it's going to be driving increased um, in, you know, unemployment uh, in the labour market as well. So not only are we going to see you know, falling economic growth, very likely as a result of this, but also we're going to see increasing unemployment. Now, on top of this, okay, the added sort of you know, thing to consider here is that uh, you know, obviously, it's going to change you know, our, our terms of trade. We're going to see our terms of trade fall. Uh, we should see, though, however, as well, you know, further downward pressure on the dollar as demand for our commodities decreases, which will place you know, improved international competitiveness, though, across some of our other industries. And so our real hope has to be um, that we can see some, it's not going to be all, but certainly some of the decrease in demand for commodities be offset by you know, increased international competitiveness across education, you know, exports, tourism, and service exports. Now, of course, this needs to be kept in mind with the fact, though, that the federal government is needing to control and place caps on uh, you know, international students due to the housing affordability crisis. And so our ability to necessarily offset some of this with increased education exports remains very, very uncertain. Now, of course, the final thing here is the government also does rely upon, okay, and we can see that, you know, the government forecasts, right, they have these earnings that they also want to, you know, identify in terms of their own tax revenue. And so as we see a reduction here in the export revenues, they're going to also see reduced tax revenues, which will impact their budget outcomes. Now, finally, um, and I covered a little bit of this last week, but there's more that's emerging. Um, and the ACCC has now released, um, you know, basically, a, a, you know, an early version, an interim report on the supermarket sector. They've been doing a, a report looking at the market structure and the level of competition. And something I shared in last week's episode is that Australia aims for workable competition. That is the mix of economies of scale, right, with, um, you know, you know, of course, driving costs down to get to sort of, you know, lowest cost technical optimums, right? But on the flip side, we want a level of competition. Now, what the ACCC has admitted, okay, is that they have identified essentially, okay, um, and this is not going to come as a surprise, right, that there is an oligop oligopolistic market structure and that it can limit incentives to compete vigorously on price. Well, of course, right? Um, and what they've identified is we can see that Woolies and Coles provide a broadly similar experience to customers through largely undifferentiated product ranges pricing at similar levels Similar non-price offerings, including loyalty programs. Now, it's pretty funny that it's taken the ACCC all this time to come up with this level of interim report because I think any consumer would have been able to tell them this uh, you know, pretty clearly. Okay? Now, ultimately, um, what this is highlighting, though, is I think the ACCC identifying okay, that um, you know, uh, it looks like we haven't got the market structure right in terms of workable competition. Um, and the Labor government will be taking these you know, recommendations from the ACCC very seriously. And so we can see how potentially we're on the verge of maybe some changes in terms of the market structures that produce competition in the Australian market, which has been a key feature of microeconomic form in Australia. So there we have it, the key headlines from around the domestic and global economy. Stay tuned for next week's episodes. Otherwise, for all of those of you that have your HC economic exams coming up, all the best with your ongoing study.